Kip, to talk about space and time to most people is to talk about something that's so absolute, so given that it, 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 it just seems like part of our world, and yet space and time have a very integral relationship. Indeed, Galileo, Newton, uh, and all of the great scientists before the uh, 20th century thought of space and time as absolute and having no real intimate connection. But Einstein taught us otherwise. Einstein's great insight of 1905 was to recognize that space and time are personal. Your time flows at one rate, my time flows at a different rate. What you see as space, I may see as a mixture of space and time in a very precise sense. It's a little hard to grasp. <laughs> Uh, let's begin, say, with time. Uh, Einstein's uh, special relativity and general relativity tell us that if you move at a high speed past me and I watch clocks that you carry tick, those clocks will appear to me to tick more slowly than my clocks. But at the same time, you're going past me, of course you see me moving relative to you, you look at my clocks, you see my <laughs> clocks tick slower than yours. So I see your clocks tick slow, you see my clocks tick slow. That's Which crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. It isn't possible, but it is possible. Uh, it's, it is one of the peculiarities. It's possible because what you regard as two simultaneous events occurring at the, uh, at the same time but at different locations in space, I don't see them as simultaneous. Uh, if you have two firecrackers and you carry them with you and you move at high speed, trust me, uh, and you set them off simultaneously, mm. measurements that I make will show the firecracker at the back go off first, the firecracker at the front go off afterwards. So there are weird things in how time seems to behave in simultaneity. And that goes also into weirdness about space. You would have said, as you go from your point of view, what is space? Well, it's all those events like firecracker, uh, go, firecrackers going off that are simultaneous. And so if you have firecrackers all over the room and you set them all off simultaneously, you say, well, I had the space. At that moment of time, there was a space, and it was the space in which the firecrackers went off. But if I see all the firecrackers going off at different times, I'd say, no, that's not space. That's a mixture of space and time. It's, it's, yes, there was a space, but, uh, but you had time in there because one of the, some of the firecrackers went off first. So, so in that sense, space and time are personal. Uh, uh, what I see, what you see as space, I see as a mixture of space and time. Now, the critical factor in making this happen is the standardization of the speed of light from Einstein's special theory of relativity. How does that work? Einstein postulated, but it's a, maybe better to say that he intuited, that the speed of light will be the same as measured by everyone, no matter how they move through the universe. Now, in reality, if you go deep into the philosophy of science, what's really going on here is Einstein says, if you define your ways of measuring space and time, define the rate of flow of time in a manner that uh, makes the laws of physics look simple, so that, for example, time is ticked at a regular way by atomic clocks as atoms vibrate uh, uh, in a molecule. It's ticked at a regular way by atomic clock. And if you uh, define space in such a way that, sp that the laws of physics look simple, so that if you uh, then uh, measure the distances between atoms in a lattice, those distances are always the same. If you define things so that uh, sp length and time so that laws of physics look simple, then the speed of light will always be the same for everybody. And he recognized that. And he said, this is the way we should define lengths and time is so that the laws of physics look simple. Having chosen that, made that choice, then the speed of light is the same as seen by everybody, and then time is personal, space is personal. A very deep insight.
Which means that if uh, you're, you're traveling very rapidly towards a light beam or traveling away from the light beam, which in no normal sense, if we deal with sound, would have different characteristics, with light it would be the same. Well, you see a Doppler shift. So you see if the, li the light has modulations on it, waves, you, if you move toward the source, you see the wavelength shortened. But you don't see the speed changed. Mm. So the wavelength is shortened, the frequency goes up, but the speed is totally unchanged. That's the one constant that uh, results from asking that the l space and time defi be defined so that uh, laws look simple. What are the implications of having space and time so integrated and so personal? Well. When Einstein recognized this, these, this weird behavior of space and time, the word he used is they're relative. I prefer personal. But they, <laughs> do, they are relative to you or relative to me. And that's where the name relativity comes from. When he uh, figured that out, uh, two years later, I think it was, uh, maybe, maybe four years later, uh, one of his teachers from school named Hermann Minkowski looked at Einstein's laws and said, hey, I can write these laws in a much more beautiful mathematical form if I regard space and time as unified into a single thing called space-time. Uh, and this space-time has then four dimensions, one dimension of time and three dimensions of space. And I can formulate this unification in such a way that I can understand the personal nature of space, the personal nature of time, that you, if you move at high speed relative to me, you are in some sense slicing through space-time, taking a three-dimensional surface in space-time that is different from what I take. Uh, but there is a unified space and time, all unified together. Uh, Einstein, when he saw this uh, reformulation of his laws, he didn't think much of it. He uh, wrote that uh, uh, Minkowski is uh, taking basic physics and making it look uh, complicated. He's building this fancy mathematics that uh, uh, just isn't needed, it isn't appropriate. Until several years later he discovered he had to have that unification of space and time in order to formulate his laws of general relativity. And so it's very it built deep into the laws of warping of space and time, which is Einstein's laws of general relativity, this unification. You can't formulate a laws of warped space time. You can't get predictions of black holes. You can't get predictions of a, a, a warped side of the universe, objects in the universe made from warped space and time, such as the Big Bang singularity where the universe was born. You can't get that out without unifying space and time together in the way that Minkowski taught us how to do. Does that mean that whereas space and time are both personal or relative, I like personal too, uh, but together space-time is absolute? So that means space-time, after uh, unification, uh, is absolute. Uh, there's nothing personal about it, nothing relative about it. We make it personal by the manner in which we observe, the manner in which we move. Now, on the other hand, it is so difficult to think about this unified uh, space-time uh, that even I, as a physicist, a large fraction of, the, of uh, my work, I make a choice. I will take my personal point of view, and I will talk about space, and I will talk about time, I'll talk about the warping of space around a black hole, the warping of time, but, uh, but I will rarely talk about the warping of space-time because it's hard for a human to visualize. And our, whole, our whole senses are attuned to space and time as separate entities. And so, particularly when I communicate uh, with uh, non-physicists, but also when I do my own research, I slip back into the personal point of view because I have deeper intuitions or, well, it's easier, it's easier <laughs> uh, to think about space and time from the personal viewpoint. Minkowski's block universe has been used by philosophers, even some theologians, in coming up with all sorts of uh, interesting and wildly speculative schema. From a physicist's point of view, how do you see space-time? So a physicist stepping back from our universe 
and thinking about it geometrically and mathematically, thinks of the entire universe as being an entity that we study from outside. Uh, and we have the entire future history, the entire past history, uh, all of space going out through the universe, all of space and time, or unified space-time, as Minkowski would call it. And each point in this four dimensions, one time dimension and three space dimensions, each point is an event. The birth of Abraham Lincoln occurred here. At, if, if I think of time as going upward, the birth of Abraham Lincoln occurred here. His death occurred there. His assassination occurred there. I, during his life, he went through space-time, through this block universe where each point represents an event. He went through space-time, through the beginning of the Civil War, on up uh, to his ultimate death, moving through space-time. And we described that his, his life by a curve mm -hmm. in this four-dimensional space-time in this block universe. Uh, with space and time unified then in this geometric four-dimensional way. But there really is a difference between space directions and time directions. Space directions uh, and time directions are distinguished in that you can always go out in space and come back. You can always go forward in time, <laughs> but you can't come back. Right. Time has this inexorable flow in the forward direction. So, so it's a very rich block universe with these different kinds of behaviors. What do you do with the future? What do I do with the future? Yeah. I enjoy it as it comes. <laughs> but in the block universe, it's already there? In the block universe, as I step back and think about it mathematically, geometrically, it's already there. The entire universe is there, the beginning, the end, if there is an end. Uh, it's a little fuzzy in my mind because I don't know what's up there. I think right. I know what's, what's right. at the beginning. Um, but you describe the, well, look, we do it all the time. You, you have a novel, you read it, it's whole, the whole story is there. It's uh, in the book uh, uh, from yeah, beginning to end. Yeah. It's all there. But as you read it through, you feel the flow. Mm. But it's all there uh, in front of you. So how then does the future exist uh, in the block universe? Is, is, there, is there some deep philosophical... Well, the future principle? is here and the past is there. <laughs> I don't think there's any deep philosophy. There's mathematics. Um, uh, physicists, to some degree, are philosophers of science because we interpret our mathematics mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, interpret certain pieces of warping of space and time as being the thing that holds us to the surface of the Earth, gravity. Uh, we uh, interpret the mathematics, the description of horizons of black holes. You can go in, you can't come out. That interpretation of the mathematics has a certain philosophical content. But philosophers often take this far beyond where we want to go. We want to go only far enough that it is useful to us, that it helps us get uh, predictions out, and we, at least most of us, prefer not to, to carry the philosophizing farther. And so simply the block universe uh, has future up here, past down there, that's it. Uh, but anyone who lives in the block universe feels the flow of time from past toward future. Uh, but I as a physicist looking in from the outside just see it as a unified entity. 